All right, so now we're done talking about the shoulder slash pectoral girdle. So let's talk about the, our, our upper arm bone, a.k.a. our humerus. So these are the major things I want you to know. So everything I have in bold. And italicize, I mean, not that they're not important, but I think the bold ones are the ones I definitely want you to know. So what we have here is the head of the humerus. So this is the ball that fits into your glenoid fossa right there. So notice that the head is very round. And the long part of this, remember the humerus is a long bone, so this long skinny part is the shaft. So whenever you have a head and a shaft of a bone and a long bone, the part that connects it is called the neck. Now this is what we call the anatomical neck. So in other non-human animals, this might be a little more elongated and discernible, but it's just a very, very thick neck. So it's kind of like this guy right here. I, like my friends, they watch, I think it was called 90 Day Fiance. I see all the memes. But he has a neck, right? It's just very thick. Same with the anatomical neck. It's very thick. It's still a neck, but still there. He has a head. He has a neck. And so does your humerus. It has an anatomical neck. It's just very thick. But the humerus is also very special in that it has an anatomical neck, but also something called the surgical neck. And why is it called the surgical neck? Well, the thing is that this is a weak point. So if someone breaks the neck of their humerus, they're more likely to break it on this thinner part, the surgical neck, than they are in this very thick anatomical neck. So this is why the humerus has two necks. The anatomical neck is the one that's more in terms of anatomy, uh, comparative anatomy with other animals, but the surgical neck is the one that's more frequently broken of the two. And then you have something called the greater tubercle. Again, remember a tubercle meaning a rough, small bump. And so you have a greater tubercle and you have a smaller one that's more anterior called the lesser tubercle. Now between the tubercles, you have something called the, in so whenever you have that prefix enter, that means between. So what should we call this little, little depression, this little furrow between the two tubercles, tubercles? Let's call it the intertubercular groove. So that's what we have here on the anterior. And then, so let's talk about the bottom part and the more distal. So again, this is proximal, closer to the trunk of the body. And now let's go more distal toward this part. Okay, so this is the right humerus and the elbow joint. And this is what we have condyles. So this whole part here, these are condyles and they have special parts. The condyles have, depending whether it's more medial or lateral, they have different names for these parts. So the part that's more lateral, that's what we call the capitulum. The part that's here, the trochlea, appears multiple times in anatomy. So trochlea, trochlea means some sort of like sling or pulley. So what we have here, oh, and another prefix. Remember epi meaning outer or above, just like in epigastric, epidermis. So we'll, not only do you have condyles right here, but you also have epicondyles. So notice that compared to the condyles, these epicondyles, they're not they're a little above and they're a little outer. So this is the lateral epicondyle. Again, this is why lateral and medial becomes very, become very important when we're talking about appendicular. So again, the lateral epicondyle is outer and slightly above the regular condyles. And then opposite of lateral, on the other side, we have the medial epi epicondyle. And again, why don't we use left or right? Well, we're looking at the right humerus. If we use left and right, then these would be kind of switched. So this is why we use lateral and medial versus left and right when we're talking about these epicondyles. And then what we have here, so here have the humerus, and this is the capitulum and the trochlea. So this is, so which bone is this? So this is what we call the radius. And this is what we have is the ulna. So again, we're looking at the back of this, this um, elbow joint, or actually front of that. <laughs> we're looking at the front of the elbow joint. So again, we have the radius and we have the ulna. And this is where we have the renal notch. So let's go to the a top hat question. All right, so top hat question. What is the anatomical term for the back of the elbow?
Okay, let's see how everyone did. So it looks like most of you said olecranon, and most of you are correct. So the back of your elbow is called the olecranon. All right, so why is it important? Well, hey, what should we call that point of your elbow? That's the point. So if you actually feel your elbow, so that bony, bony point of your elbow, that's what you're feeling. You're feeling the olecranon. So that's the back of your elbow, and then it articulates with the olecranon fossa of the humerus. Remember, a fossa is some sort of indentation. And in general, when I was talking first talking about bone markings, remember, when you have some sort of indentation, something fits into that. So you notice that the olecranon of the ulna fits into the olecranon fossa. Now again, we're, this is why we have to know proximal and distal. Proximal meaning closer toward the, in, at least in this sense, referring back toward the trunk of the body. So notice that this is the back side, the posterior view. So now you know, see that back point of your elbow, the olecranon. And then you have all the ulna and radius. And again, this is up in your slides, and I'll walk you through some of these landmarks. So here we have the right radius and the ulna. And then we have something called, remember that term called inter or between and among? Sorry, that's the Jaybird in the background. I apologize. <laughs> He's wanting attention. <laughs> okay, quiet. All right. Um, quick break. <laughs> I'll be back. Okay, we're back. Yeah, he's here. He was just kind of like... <laughs> so that's what you hear in the background. Sorry about that. Yeah, Peanut is now... He's about to celebrate his 17th birthday, so he's kind of like <laughs> cranky right now. He probably wants a nap. All right, so <laughs> back to our... <laughs> I know. Actually, now I think of it, next year he'll probably be as old as the next batch of undergrads. Wow. Okay, so then what we have here is the radius and ulna. So now we have a bunch of tissue between the radius and ulna, right? So remember that prefix meaning inter. So now we have the, so inter, and remember that other root word osteo or os, that refers to bone. So what we have here is the interosseous membrane. So again, membrane, a general term meaning some flat sheet. So this helps to anchor the both of them. So together. So it's not just like clattering among each other. You have that interosseous membrane to have some sort of stability between the radius and ulna. Now what we have here are the styloid process. So do you remember that stylus, styloid process of the temporal bone? So these are little pointy parts too. They put jut out. So both the ulna and radius has a styloid process. And then what we have here that's more distal. Let's talk about other structures. So here we have the olecranon, and here we have the radial notch. But this part right here, this trochlear notch. Now, if I just show you a bone, I just show you a picture of uh, any bone, well, what's a dead giveaway? How can you easily identify the ulna? Well, what I look for is that if, there's, if I'm looking at some sort of arm bone, is there a trochlear notch? And why is that? Well, I like to think of it this way. This is the ulna, right? So I like to think of the trochlear notch, it kind of has that sharp curve that I think it looks like a shallow U. So what bone starts with the U? I look for the U and that's the ulna. So that's a dead giveaway to me that that's the ulna. If I see that trochlear notch that's shaped like a U, it's probably an ulna. Now then we have the radial head. So compared to the ulna, so remember that ulna has that trochlear notch shaped like a U. whereas now your book doesn't really have a nice picture of the radial head from the more proximal and anterior side, or actually, I would say, I guess an anatomical position would be superior. But if you took the radius and kind of flipped it so that this head was pointing toward you, it would look like this. So not this radial head, but this radial head. So notice that, I think it's from some orthopedic journal, that's why it's all bloody. But yeah, this is a, the head of a radius. And what general geometric shape is that? Kind of circular, right? And what do you call this line going from the center of a circle to the outside? That's called the radius. So that's some way I kind of, another dead sign giveaway for me, if something's a radius. If the head of our, one of the ends is shaped like a circle, very round, this is the radius. All right, so then we have our anterior view of the elbow joint. 
So we have the capitulum that's more lateral, and we have the trochlea that's more medial. Now, which one associates with the radius? Which one associates with the ulna? Hmm, sounds like a good question, huh? So this is the way I memorize it. So here, who's this? That's Captain America, right? So capitulum is Captain America. What shape is Captain, or what does Captain America carry around? Captain America carries around a shield, right? And what shape is the shield? The shape shield is circular, it's round. And hey, which has a round head? The radius or the ulna? So again, the radius has a round head. That's why I make a big deal about it. So Captain America carries the round shield. The capitulum articulates with the head of the radius that's round. So this is the way I remember. And by process of elimination, the trochlea associates and articulates with the ulna. Okay, so I think we can... Oh, we're making good time. All right, so then we have the bones of the right wrist, wrist and hand. So what we have here, I'll walk you through these. So let's talk about our finger bones. And again, if you do... So again, this is why proximal and distal become very important. Why? So all of these collectively are known as phalanges, these finger bones. So, hey, you have fingers, right? So all of these bones right here, you can feel in your fingers. So notice that, like, in your thumb. Hey, you can only really feel two bones right here, right? One, two. And then you have three bones right here. So then again, you can feel all those bones. These are all phalanges. How do you determine them from each other? How do you know which one is which? Well, how do you classify them? Well, proximal is the ones that are the ones that are closer to the center of your body. So these are the ones that are closer to your palm. Whereas the distal, you have the middle ones that are between the proximal and the distal. So again, distal, these are the ones furthest from the center of your body and trunk and furthest from your palm. Whereas the proximal ones, these are the ones that are closer and the middle ones are just in the middle. Now let's look at our pollux. So our pollux is, doesn't have three, but how do you classify that? Well, the one that's closer to you, your trunk is called the po proximal phalanx. And then the one that's distal and further from your center of your body, that's the distal phalanx. Is, why isn't there a middle phalanx? Well, again, there's only two phalanges here in your pollux. Now let's talk about the other bones in the hand and wrist. So we have our pollux and we have our phalanges. But then your wrist bones, these collectively are called your carpals. So your carpals are, again, you have your radius and your ulna, and then carpals are form the base of your palm and wrist. So that's what we have here. So what do we call these between the carpals and the phalanges? Hey, remember that epiphysis, diaphysis, and that metaphysis in the in middle? So met meta often means middle in some cases, and this is where we use that term meta again. So metacarpals are the ones that are between your carpals and your phalanges. So you can feel your metacarpals, especially on the back side of your hand. You can feel the bony metacarpals. So again, these are, why can't you f um, feel them like your phalanges? Well, again, these are the ones contained within the meaty part of your palm. So you can feel them in your palm, especially from the back end. So another way I like to think of it as meaty carpals. They're very meaty compared to your phalanges. Now, how do you count in anatomy? So how do you tell one metacarpal from another? Well, the way you classify them is count like this. You count anatomy, you count one, two, three, four, five. So you start with your thumb, work your way to the pinky at the five. So one, two, three, four, five. That's your metacarpals, one through five. All right, so we're looking at the anterior, so the front of the right hand, but we're actually kind of doing it like this. So what we're having with the anterior, the, actually, I think this is mirror imaged a bit. Yeah, so we're actually looking kind of like this. Ah, not flexible enough for that. But so these are the carpal bones and there are eight carpal bones. So we have the scaphoid, lunate, and then triquitrum and pisiform. Now this is a crazy thing. Like lunate, it comes from lunar and they say it looks like a half moon. I'm like, uh, okay, whatever. But yeah, so triquitrum and pisiform. I sometimes like to say pisiform because it's round like a P. But this is where anatomy is, this I got admit, I have trouble, yeah, so I have trouble 
I had trouble when I was first learning anatomy with these carpal bones because this is what gets me. So you have your trochotrum, your trapezium, and your trapezoid. And I'm like, why couldn't you choose different names? Like these all sound very similar. They all start with TR something. So this is one mnemonic. And if you're not from Hawaii, you probably won't get this. But my favorite mnemonic for the triquitrum and the pisiform. So it's try quit before you piss me off. So it's not said pisiform, but the, the mnemonic doesn't work. So this is the way I remember that the triquitrum articulates with the pisiform. So the try quit before you piss me off. And, that, and to translate that to proper English, that means please stop before you make me angry. So yeah, that's local pigeon for, for, for like that. Okay, so then trapezium and trapezoid. This, this is also why I had a hard time when I was first learning anatomy. I'm like, really? You're going to start them both with trapezoid, like that four-sided polygon, whatever. So this is another mnemonic I came up with. So go be smart. Don't be dumb. Your trapezium is on your thumb. So your trapezium is on your thumb right here, your pollux. So this is the way you remember it. Trapezium is on your thumb. So the trapezium is the part that articulates with your pollux right there. And the scaphoid, yes, that articulates with the radius. The capitate is a little easier because it's like, I mean, as you can see, it's pretty big and prominent, like Captain America. So yeah, capitate, that's pretty right there. And the hammate has this little hook. So I like to think of it like, like a ham hock has a little bone poking out or like it has just or like if you play Among Us, that little bone that pokes out of a dead crewmate. So the hammate has this little ham hock pointing out this little high, this little bone right here. So that yeah, is carpal bones are hard at first, but once you get it, you get it. But what do I like? I love mnemonics. So this is my favorite mnemonic. And the thing is that whenever you use a mnemonic like this, make sure you know which side you're looking at. So here we're looking at the anterior of the hand. So what we have here is straight left to pinky. And again, this is the radius and the ulna right here. So scaphoid, lunate, triquitrum, and pisiform. And then here comes the thumb. And remember, your trapezium is on your thumb. So this is why I love it. Not only does it give you the first letters, it actually has a direction. So just remember, you're starting closer and proximal, but you're working your way more distal and back towards the thumb. This is like my favorite. There's other mnemonics out there, but this is why this is my favorite mnemonic for the carpal bones. And sometimes I catch myself like if I haven't studied anatomy for a while, I'm like, okay, yeah, this is the, okay, got it. So yeah, but if you don't like mnemonics, don't worry. And okay, so actually we're done with the upper limb and check shoulder and pectoral girdle. So I'm pretty, I think we can call it a day for today actually, because I think Rather than rush through the pelvic girdle and the lower limb, let's leave that for Friday. So again, I have a faculty meeting at three, or a faculty senate meeting at three o'clock. So I can pop into um, Zoom at right after this. So see you all. Late day today. We actually got finished on time miraculously, despite this guy trying to. But that's okay. I like you anyway. Even though he tried to disrupt my... <laughs> yeah, he's angry. I interrupted his nap. But yeah. Yeah. My 16-year-old man. 16-year-old <laughs> boy. Yeah, so despite him being kind of angry, we still ended on time. So yes. Yeah. All right, so see you all on Friday. Thanks for tuning in, and take care and stay healthy, all right?